to the Rediscovery channel. This is the channel where every week I, Ivor Kovac, and my good friend Stilgar take turns coming up with topics from history that the other person doesn't know about and often hasn't heard about. And today, however, we have a guest speaker, and her name is Blue Hour. And like me, she also writes sci-fi and fantasy. But our backgrounds are a little different, whereas my education was in history, hers is actually in film. So I'm going to go ahead and give her the floor so she can proceed with her topic. So go ahead, uh, Blue Hour. Okay, hi. Hey. How are y'all doing today? Um, so today I'm doing a new segment for my Forgotten History podcast and Discovery Channel podcast with uh, about knighthood. And this is going to be my first ever segment episode. The reason why I'm doing knighthood is because I was interested in it due to the fact that after Queen Elizabeth died, they kept showing clips of her knighting the knights. So... This is just the first segment of my knighthood series that I will be doing, and it'll go all the way down to modern knighthood. Today's knighthood segment would be about the origins of knighthood, how it got started, and chivalry. So what does one think of when you see or hear the word knight? King Arthur and the knights of the round table, maybe, or a queen knighting her valiant chivalry hero warrior that saves the day. Okay, but those knights of legend and myth, apparently, of the knights that we were familiar with today, they aren't the truth of what the knights really were. And I found out a lot of information. This is like sort of the forgotten history of the knighthood. So I'm going to ask a question like, what is the forgotten history of knighthood? And this is how we're going to find out. I want to first tell you a little bit about the word knight. The word knight originally came from Old English, meaning boy or servant. And it's a cognate of the German word neat, servant, bondsman, vassal. What I found was that it goes all the way far back, even into like ancient Rome. There was a knightly class called Ordo S. Clistius, Order of the Mounted Nobles. I haven't really looked into them, so I'm going to do a separate video about the Order of Knight, and then I'll talk more about the Ordo as Questions, Order of uh, Mounted Nobles, because there's a lot of nobles in knighthood, a lot of different classes of knight and knighthood. So we're, I'm going to be doing that separately. But that's where basically like the word knight came from. And knighthood is actually a word for like early medieval period. Well-equipped horsemen was often described as knight. It was like originally like a Latin word. Apparently, the first knights appeared during the reign of Charlemagne in the 8th century. So they go all the way back before the 11th century, but into like starting in the 8th century. As the Carolan age progressed, the Franks were generally on the attack and larger numbers of warriors took to their horses to ride the emperor who had wide-ranging campaigns of conquest. At this time, they, they needed the knight to do this. The order of Carolan ceremony of presenting uh, weapons and influence of the knighthood, they did like knighthood ceremonies and so so forth and i'll be also talking about another like on another video about like the ceremonies and rituals but these knights they they're not really at this time with like the eighth century even though like these kings these kings needed these these knights to help them with different things warriors for their armies to attack and whatnot they weren't really what we would call the way we think of knights so between the middle ages from the years 500 to 11 knights were they were really like these violent people they plundered they raped they burned down villages and they battled different villages or in countries but one of my questions was what did they battle and why i went into more information about that so because of, of like the pillaging and the clerics in the church often opposed the, the practices of the knight. Through this, they started like this chivalry code. The chivalry code, however, wasn't always really used or it was used, but I also found out that some of the knight, even if they wanted to go by the chivalry code, they didn't. It became problematic and complex for the knight because of the chivalry code, because they had to live to the, these contradictory standards of like, what they thought that they should be, no matter what they did to uphold like the laws and codes of chivalry, they would never find peace within their societies or 
for themselves. So, and then this all goes back into what chivalry was, what like what knighthood was, and why they did things that they did. So, chivalry was a response started by the Catholic Church because of what the the knights were doing when they went to battle. It was like supposedly by the year 1066 and 11th century, chivalry had become a, a new trend, and they became the knights from what we know as of today's and today's stories. This new trend in the 11th century had a code. There was two types of code, 10 commandments of chivalry, and then there was codified medieval noble conduct code that was started before the 1170 and 1220 between those years. And so I'm gonna go in further of what those codes were and why they were important in a little bit. The chivalry itself, it meant horsemanship, and it came from France in the 11th century. But it was a word that originally also came from Latin. And in French, it meant the man with great standing and upbringing with, with noble ancestry. It changed to mean somebody with status within the military. It was considered to be a perfect ideal of the Christian warrior at that point. But then it was propagated, so it was romanticized to fit a certain way of life. And then what I found was that within various medieval texts, ideas were usually summarized by the ritual of Christian knighthood and examined the qualities of what knighthood was supposed to be, therefore emphasizing the kind of prose where where they talked about chivalry being a way of life for the military, nobility, and religion. I don't know why they would do just those three and why they specifically wanted chivalry to, to be those, but what I found was for that time period, it was a living institution that even appeared as far back as the Roman Empire. And I thought that was kind of interesting that chivalry existed even then. I'm sorry, do you think it has something to do with the cost of upkeep of horses? Um, possibly, I think I think so, but I'm not sure. It could have been that because they were considered horsemen. Like there was wealth associated with it, right? Right. No, I think that's what it was. And, and uh, like the old, uh, during the Roman Empire, it sounds like you're thinking about maybe the uh, patrician class, right? Was maybe the patricians were the original uh, mounted cavalry. Right. I'm going to go into that because that was a different order of knight, apparently. Yeah. Because yeah. when I mentioned it before, it was connected to the knightly class, the order of equestrians, the order of mounted nobles. And those are the ones from ancient Rome. So you're right. It goes back. Video about yeah, during the Civil War, you know, in our country, what I heard is that, like, the Confederates, you know, they had a shortage of everything. And if anything got wrecked or killed or destroyed, they usually couldn't replace it. But, like, on the Confederate side, the guys that were mounted, the cavalry, they all had to bring their own horses. So usually the, the people that were in the cavalry were all kind of upper class people. And then regular people would be foot soldiers. And I think it was like that medieval Europe was like that, too, with the wealthy people being the knights and then the regular guys being the men at arms. Like in your research, did you ever find a case where some regular guy that uh, was not wealthy or attached to land managed to become a knight? Yeah, regular common people were originally were able to become knights, but... At a certain time and period, after the Hundred Year War, they changed it to only nobility. Ah, oh, okay. That only nobility can become knights. Hmm. Yeah. yeah the, the original knights, what you mentioned about uh, the way you spell it, I, I looked it up. Uh, Knecht is one version, which in Dutch yeah. means servant. And actually, uh, Santa Claus has servants, and we call them knechte. And it was, so yeah, basically it was a servant of, of somebody of royal or of nobility. And they would start as a page, and then they would have to go through trials. And also there were rituals involved, which you can probably dive into more. Right. And then at some point they would be turned into knights if they were deemed worthy, or if they proved themselves on the battlefield. Right. So, yeah. But it's just these mm -hmm. were common people, but I guess at a certain time they just wanted to just have it nobility. It would be interesting to see uh, what some of the reasons for that were, how that right. came to be. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. it's interesting that a word that means basically servant becomes a word for somebody that's like you know like a royal or somebody that's of noble blood. So how how that came to be, like when did that switch? How long did it take? So. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it 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 ties into chivalry because there was this scholar, right, by the name of John Charles Leonard, and he said that chivalry could not be mistaken and could not compare it to or mistaken it to with the feudal system of that time period, and they were two separate things. But the feudal system was the real life of the time period, but chivalry was the ideal world, and that such that existed as such for like the romance writers of that day. They wanted it to be a certain status. They wanted to put it into like a class. That's also kind of like the caste system in India where you have the Kshetriyas that were the original warrior class. So like the original caste system was just three castes originally. You had the Brahmins, the Kshetriyas, and the Vaisyas. And the Vaisyas were all the workers, any kind of work, whether it's a merchant or somebody who's tilling the ground. And the Brahmins were the religious priestly class, and the Kshetriyas were the fighters. And that was the original structure of like the Vedic Aryans. And then when they invaded India, they ended up creating more castes over time. But the Kshetriyas became a ruling class. And so even though, according to the religion, the Brahmins were considered the highest class. It was actually the Kshetriyas that were in charge of physically running everything. They had all the positions of power. There was a medieval saying in medieval Europe, like those who fight, those who pray, and those who work. And it seems like the like yes. those who fight end up also being those who rule a little bit. Yeah, yeah and that, that's the knights played an important role in the, the creation of feudalism in Europe. And the knights were created, again, as a response in to, to both the invasions of the Muslims, but also of the, the Vikings. Right, right. Um, because they, they needed to have armed personnel, so to speak, that the royals would need, or the noble people would need armed people spread out across Europe, even in small towns, because, you know, a Viking incursion or a Muslim raid could happen at any point. So you couldn't just have a large army based around your capital city. By the time that they would show up, the invaders would already be gone, taking all the women and all the money and everything. So, yeah, so I think it's interesting that, that this is part of what kickstarted feudalism in Europe by and created this caste system until infantry started to take uh, the place of knighthood. Because at some point, of course, you have the guns and, and also landsmen that uh, become more and more important. But that's much later on in, uh, in history. So. Right. Originally, it wasn't supposed to be a military. It was more of a social phenomenon than a military one. And I guess it just grew to that point. They want this ideal means to like transform the corrupt secular world of what was happening. So I think that's why they use the, the romance literature to propagate what the knighthood and chivalry was, because chivalry didn't always work. And it's first form and I don't think it was pure because remember I mentioned the reality for it for the knights were like very complex. The codes of chivalry were contradictory. It was ten commandments of chivalry. I'm sorry, can you go through all the commandments for us yeah. if you have so, that use? Okay, so one was like they shall believe that the church teaches and observe in all directions. That was number one. They shall defend the church they shall respect all weaknesses and constitute their, themselves the defender of themselves. They should love the country of which they were born and should not recoil from the enemy. They shall make war against the infidel without secession and without mercy. They should, shall perform structurally thy feudal duties if they if they be not contrary to the laws of God, following the laws of God said, they couldn't lie, and they had to remain faithful to the, the pledged word of their oath. They had to be generous and give largest to everyone, and everywhere and always, the, they had to be like the champion of right and good and injustice and evil. Those were the Ten Commandments of the Code of Chivalry. I can understand why they found the knights themselves found this problematic, and that's why chivalry failed because they couldn't be to that standard of this code. They couldn't follow this code. So 
and that's why they went all out and propagated the romance literature of the medieval times, like the King Arthur, the Knights of the Round Table, and whatnot. So, and that's one of the reasons why they did that because it just fell right in front of them. Like the church wanted to change these people, but the people themselves didn't want to. The knights didn't want to change. So, with even following this code, and I guess the, like the code was hard to follow. <laughs> For them. I don't know why, but... Yeah, I don't think it would be hard to follow for us, but there'd be a lot of temptations definitely not to. And of course, all these different, a lot of these different countries in Europe were still fighting each other. And so it'd be kind of like rules of engagement. It seems like the Catholic Church was trying to set rules of engagement in order to prevent atrocities and such. And like some of the Germanic invasions when the Roman Empire fell were pretty... There's some pretty disturbing things that happen. We had that video we did earlier talking about Alboin of Italy, where after he conquered the Gipids, he took the daughter of the king, Rosamunda, and forced her to become his wife. And then one day when he was drunk, he well, he took her father's, severed her father's head and turned the skull into like a drinking cup. And then one day when he was drunk in front of all his nobles, he tried to force her to drink from it. He said, hey, you want to have a... Uh, Mary drink with your father, you know, atrocious stuff like that. And of course she killed him for that. And then later on she got killed herself, but it makes sense, you know, and like one thing, the Catholic church previously, they had been used to stability because during the Roman times, once Christianity was legalized and especially after they became the religion of state, they didn't have to worry so much about being physically killed and having barbarians come and destroy everything and loot the treasury. But when the Roman empire fell, now they had to find some kind of new balance, and they had to rely on these Germanic lords. The first, they had to get them into the Catholic Church, and then they had to give them like some standards to live by. So I can understand why they did this stuff. I it's also understand. early. It's also early Christianity, like for Northern Europe. So, like you said, like they're just getting into the church. So, how much of the church doctrines do they really know? Like, do they really know what's in the Bible? Like, do they really know God? Or is it just something that, do they just know some basic principles and that's it? So Maybe that's why they switched it to just having nobility as night. Do you know if they were supposed to read the Bible back then, or were they? They were at least able to read it, because they, they would be able to read. And most normal people wouldn't be, they would be illiterate, so they wouldn't be able to read it. And plus, the masses were held in Latin. So that probably didn't help either. One other point I want to mention is that these knights in the early stages, but also later on, they were they weren't just killing invaders. They were also just killing people from you know that were serving the Lord, just adjacent to whatever kingdom or or territory they were living in. So they were to some extent they were just merchants for hire and. The mercenaries. So yeah, exactly. That's what I'm sorry. <laughs> so they they were just they were killing people for a living, and you know you wonder like okay, and, and then you you make them out to be more worthy than the the average person. Like you put them on a pedestal, so to speak. So yeah, I, th I think of course they're going to have a hard time adhering to certain rules and and not being like i think this a similar thing happened with the samurai if i'm not mistaken in feudal japan where they also they they had rules when it came to other samurai but when it came to the commoner i think they could basically do whatever they wanted to them or i don't know am i am i off here um, no i think that's probably the case uh, when, i mean it wouldn't surprise me i don't know as much about japan but i think that's I know they were very abusive towards the Ainu, which uh, I mean that's a whole nother topic. But right. uh, I think uh, I think uh, I think that's right. Uh, you think so, Blue Hour? Is that the case with you know if that's the case yeah. with Japan? I mean, if you can compare, I know only a little bit about the samurai, but if you could go like and compare samurai with the knight, then I guess it would be yeah. There really historically there really hasn't been a lot of protection for common people, like regular people that do most of the work in every society. Like they've always been kind of seen in pretty much every part of the world as a servant class or they exist to serve the state or the nobility. That's one of the things that made America unique is that there were protections, constitutional rule of law based protections to kind of ensure that the common people were respected. 
But that's not the normal situation for most of history for most of the world. I, I think that's why they had to reinvent chivalry. It's an honor system, basically. I think the only thing the Catholic Church could really do if they found out about some infraction is they could excommunicate those people. And then, but then, you know, and they may also just require like a, a payment like a bounty or you know, give the money to the church and then we'll forgive you kind of thing. Yeah, there's there's actually a French knight in, in the Blue Hour, I think you should do a podcast on this, that was actually a mass murderer. Pretty sure he was, if I remember correctly, he was killing like women and children, like torturing them. So there's, there's a story around that as well. And I think he, in the end, he was killed or uh, what do you call it? Well, Anyway, I don't know the English word right now, but he was killed by the church for his, punished for his crimes, I guess, with the death penalty. Right. You know how, like, when they say, oh, you did something wrong, we're going to send you out of the country. We're going to send you away. Exile. Exile. And there's also banishment. Banishment and exile. So that's, that's what they could do or either kill them. It's the simple fact that these knights were afraid of all that, but they continued to do what they did. They were also war heroes many times, you know, so... Yeah, they're... Like, the church was unlimited to what it could do to them because they were, you know, sometimes they had won big battles, etc. Right. Played an important role in battles. So what are you going to do as a church? Like, they're very popular with, with nobility. Like, how right. much control do you have over them? But the thing that got me was that how the question that I wanted to, to figure out was why did they have to keep changing it up? Why didn't that chivalry work the first time if it was such a big deal? And why propagate it to put it into people's heads that, oh, we have to do chivalry. They had to do that. They had to have it where it had to be, we have to protect the female. We have to, that's what chivalry soon became. That's what they tried. But can, can you imagine like being a knight and you serve your lord and then you're sent out and you're you have to fight uh, an opposing army that's just a couple towns over they speak the same language they look like you and they you know you battle them it's not like nowadays you shoot them you know you might not even see them you should go with artillery or whatever use a drone or use a gun you know no you actually have to go in there right towards them and then actually you have to smash them with your swords and you feel your sword going through their their skulls and their bones etc um and like part your friends are getting gutted and you know it's not like there's like pain medication or there's any antibiotics so people are like kind of lying on the field like dying and screaming it's, you know, it was pretty brutal warfare back then and they have to come back and you have to be all like nightly and, and adhere to all those codes. I can imagine it being pretty hard. I don't know. It's probably got some guys with PTSD, you know, and like in Vietnam, you know, where sometimes uh, soldiers, they get they get activated by certain sounds and things like that. Right. Yeah, maybe they couldn't, you know, maybe some of these guys could not uh, fit back into normal society after doing some of that, you know, being in a certain amount of battles. The simple fact that the church tried to adhere to that nobility standard and then the knight didn't couldn't like it doesn't make any sense why why would they want us to think oh it's such a romantic notion of being a knight i think uh yeah i think like you said it was an effort to make these people behave well by trying to kind of get them to be internally like uh, internally motivated to do good rather than just fearing threats and it was only marginally successful. And I know, like, in the 1800s, because I, I remember, like, I had to read a lot of 1800s literature in high school. And they, they, they used to like to talk about knights and these old battles and things. Like, they were kind of stuck on it mentally, was my impression, like, English literature especially. And I'm wondering if it has something to do with, like, maybe it's a reaction to some of the uh, military developments in the 1800s. Like the 1800s was when armor was finally abolished completely. I think the last unit that had any kind of armor was uh, the cuirassiers, which were used, uh, I know for a fact, were used in the war between Napoleon and uh, Russians. They both made use of cuirassiers who wore, wore like a, a breastplate and a helmet. 
and they were still used as heavy cavalry to kind of kill uh, foot soldiers. But I'm wondering also, like in the 1800s, I think uh, the first Gatling gun came out. We're getting more towards like mass death in warfare, large mass scale killing. So I'm thinking maybe in like the 1800s literature, they were probably running on nostalgia. Like, uh, remember these better times when knights, uh, when soldiers had honor and they had to fight face to face as opposed to lining up in fields, you know, like in the 1800s, lining up row and row and then like shooting at each other. And then like you get down and then reload while the next group of guys shoots. Like, that's crazy to just li- imagine like just lining up like, hey. We're going to march in a line and we're going to take turns shooting at these other, like that's, so I, I can kind of see like maybe how they would romanticize and think of the past as better compared with. Yeah, these educated men that rode about. horses and knew these codes of behavior and, and then, yeah, and then you juxtapose it to these, basically it's just common farmers that you give them a, a gun. And, Professional uh, soldiers that aren't paid yeah. nearly as well. and Yeah. And then yeah. you mentioned earlier of how to become a knight and how they went through the different stages to become a knight. For the commoner to do that, I don't think it would have been very hard. But I guess the church, and then this is what I'm going to go go into in another video, but the different stages of the knighthood or whatnot. But in order to raise the rank, do you think they didn't want them to be nobility? That they didn't want the commoners connected to royalty or do you still think they wanted them to be their servants or whatnot I, I think- I'd, be, I'd be curious to hear more listen more about how they became these knights like the royal knights or noble knights uh, because it's you know like you mentioned they started off as servants so what happened is it just a natural flow of you know the prestige they gathered and because they just you know received favors from the lords they were serving mm-hmm. and and you know how did they become this separate class from just uh from their hum- more humble beginnings maybe you could do an episode about that as well right because like you you know you know that like, every time somebody be that knighted right and i'm gonna go into mm-hmm. the, the knighted in another episode too every time somebody got knighted they they got a piece of land they got their own land. That's what I read. That they got their own yeah. land. So that meant they're gonna get their own. I guess that that would have meant they got their own servants or whatnot as well. So to think of a servant having a servant, I guess that wouldn't have went well with the the people of that day, right? I don't know. Uh, yeah, good question. Or I think the term people. was vassal, right, for the knights. Like you have yeah. the king, and then the knight would be called the vassal, and then the people under the knight were serfs. Yeah, the serfs. Yeah, they would have their own. But then they would have kids, and they would be automatically. Yeah, because then, then they made it where that once they were a knight, their children were going to become their the the the, the boy children would become knights, and sometimes the girl children would become knight. They would inherit it. They would inherit the land and everything. And then they could raise the ranks from knight to another status within nobility. So they can go from knight to something else. I'm going I'm to do another video based on it, but they didn't have to always stay a knight, you know? Yeah. It sounds like, like there's a lot of, uh, lot of material still left to cover. Right. And I think covering the King Arthur aspect, that would be a total another video with it as well, because knighthood and uh, King Arthur myths and legends had a lot to do with the knighthood. It's kind of interesting how, like, Arthur and his guys are considered as, like, folk heroes over in England, when, in fact, they were the guys that were trying to prevent the English from taking over their land. Like, they were the enemies of the English people. But they're considered, like, you know, folk heroes over there. It's kind of it's kind of interesting, like, it's an example of the winners elevating the losers in that conflict. And I wonder how similar that culture, like, I've heard different theories about Arthur. And I'm wondering how similar that culture was to the the Latin culture, you know, the, because the Romans, they administered that area as a province and Latin was the official language. Originally, they were they were Celts or Celts. People are telling me I should say with a hard C. And like the Gauls also and the people of Spain, they were 
overwhelmingly uh, Celtic or Celtic, and they just became Romanized and spoke Latin. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm wondering if the English had never invaded England, if that would have been like another Romance language that developed there. And I'm wondering Most how likely. real, yeah, and yeah, how I mean, real are those people either? Saying it seems like they might just be a morality tale too. Uh, right. Kind of like the, uh, the noble Native Americans. Yeah. Right? That uh, were always peaceful and in tune with nature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like that. When did uh, that be another thing is like the views of Native Americans over time? Because yeah. some of those people were very, were like, uh, you know, people were terrified of some of those Native Americans. I mean, that's, that's like getting into another topic, but. I heard that, like the Comanches, they were kind of like the Assyrians of the plains, and same level of brutality. And they uh, supposedly sent to Anna. The reason he invited Americans to come into Texas was because he wasn't able to deal with the Comanches, and he was hoping they would take care of the problem for him. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's that's what I heard is one of his reasons. Uh, that's another topic. Yeah. So that's that's basically. For right now, what I had, I wanted to talk more about the sugary. Next time, I'm just going to try to go deeper into the King Arthur tale and also, because it, it, it is either like segments of what I want to do. And so the next one would be going into also the, of how they became knights and the status of how they became the knights. Okay. Alrighty. Well, I appreciate you for uh, bringing this topic. And I think if nobody has anything else, we can close it out. Okay, so I guess... Uh, yeah, sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Good topic. Yep. See you in the next one. Oh.